Spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. Whether you're looking for a miracle cure or a Jedi, you've come to the right place. It's episode 420 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham. Yes, I'm going to get to give my spoiler-filled review of the premiere of Obi-Wan Kenobi from Disney Plus. Doing this with spoilers because it's going to be more fun. So if you haven't watched Obi-Wan yet, you're going to want to skip over that part of the show. But come back because I want you to see what I think of the show and see if our opinions jive on that. But I also get to talk to a great group of people from School Fool and Scholar Productions. They've got a brand new show, Don't Mind Cruxmont, which is a great scripted podcast. It's a great drama show with a lot of intrigue there. So I'm going to talk to K.A. Stats who's the writer and then, of course, producer and director Travis Vengroff about not just that show, but, you know, kind of what they do in general because because they've got a lot of great shows that they've produced over the years that I think you're really, really going to love. Also going to review the new Teen Titans Go DC Superhero Girls movie, Mayhem in the Multiverse. Talk about that. Break down the news from the Star Wars celebration. I'm talking Mandalorian. We'll talk about the Skeleton Crew show that's going to be coming. Willow's got a new trailer. We've got Indiana, some Indiana Jones news. Going to give you some release dates as well. So a whole bunch of Star Wars celebration news to talk about. Also, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. I'll get into that trailer and the Gray Man as well. But I also want to urge you to subscribe to the show. I don't push to this very often, but we're kind of at a point where I need to talk about this and that I know that some of you like to listen, you know, download the MP3, listen to RSS, and I really do appreciate that. But the more you subscribe to the show, the bigger the show can be, the bigger the show can get, the bigger guests that I can get on the show as well. So please, please subscribe on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you like to listen to your podcast. Every subscription counts. Tell your friends about the show. We're going to start doing giveaways and stuff on social media. So make sure you're following at down and nerdy seven, five, seven on Twitter and Instagram and get those. You're going to have me doing some great contests. that will be available for new and existing subscribers and followers as well. So if you've been following the show for a while, you're not going to be left out in the cold in this stuff. Did one for stranger things going to be doing more of those on kind of weekly basis or as kind of like, as I get the urge to. So please your support of the show very, very important to me in the future of the show. I can't do this without you. And if you've been supporting the show for years to come, for, for years right now, I really appreciate that. Hopefully you continue to do so for years to come. But let's get into it right now. This week going to talk to the minds behind Fool and Scholar Productions. K.A. Stats and Travis Vengroff join me next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Amelia Jones from Netflix's Rock and Key, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Well, you might already be listening to something from Fool and Scholar Productions because they have so many amazing shows. I mean, there's it seems like it's almost to the point where it's too many to list, and the two minds behind these shows are with me right now, the co-founders of Fool and Scholar. It's Travis Vengroff and K.A. Stats. Caitlin, Travis, how you doing? Good. Good. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure. It's about time. It's about time as, as far as I'm concerned. So I, I got to say, guys, you've been doing this together now for five years, creating so many incredible shows. Now you fast forward to now, millions of downloads later, awards later. What's this journey been like for the both of you? Life changing. It's actually <laughs> um, a very good descriptor. Our, our lot, I mean, how much can happen in over half a decade, I guess, but we went from having completely different careers and complete, completely different life trajectories to now we make podcasts <laughs> all the time and entertain people around the world. And yeah, it's just been completely life altering in that way. I would, I would second that. It's, it's been a lot of fun as well, though. I don't want to underplay how much fun we've had. Oh, Absolutely. Oh, I can only imagine. I love too that you guys have like a variety of different shows. Normally, when you see like a, a production like you guys have, it's a lot of the same shows. But I mean, you've got the White Vaults, different from Vast Horizon, which is different from Don't Mind, and all kinds of different genres as well. Was it important for you all to both present several different kinds of stories? And does it present any challenges in the creative creative process when you do that? I don't think we set out with an intention to kind of like mark every genre. I think we just said we have stories we want to tell and let's let's create those. We didn't go into, let's say Liberty, our very first one, 
thinking, okay, that's a sci-fi. We've checked the sci-fi box. We won't make another one. But then we made Vast Horizon. And it wasn't because we were, again, trying to do a sci-fi. It was because we had a story that we really wanted to tell, something that we felt was entertaining enough and meaningful enough to put out there. Um, yeah. Caitlin has really good ideas. And uh, when I hear these ideas, I say, okay, let's let's tell that story. So it's less to do with... Um, again, the genre thing, but more which stories that she's got in her mind that she's sort of shared with us. It's like, okay, well, let's try this one. What, what do, you, do you think you can write more on this one? I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. So it's it's been fun. All right, so let's jump right in to Don't Mind, yeah, because that's your latest show that you've got going right now. Give us a little bit of background, both of you, for anyone that might be familiar with it, and talk a little bit about how you came up with the idea for the story. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, so I had to write... I had a goal in mind where I was going to write a bunch of story ideas um, because I was going through like, I wouldn't say it's writer's block, but I got to a point where I was like, okay, I need to change something because I've been working on one story for so long, I need a break. I'm going to write a bunch of different types of things for a bunch of different other small side stories. And one of the ideas that I had was don't mind in a very rough form, like a few paragraphs long. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll get to that later. Um, flash forward, oh gosh, Couple two years, years? Yeah. yeah, two years, and I still had this story idea, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to f- really f- see if I can flesh this one out more, I'm going to turn it from a couple paragraphs into a full series outline, or a full season outline, and see if it still has that hook, So see if it still really draws, um, draws me in, and seems interesting to someone who's reading the outline, so usually that person is Travis. Yep. Uh, <laughs> And at that point, I showed it to Travis and I said, I think I have something here. It's either one or two seasons. I'm afraid that if I tried to make it two seasons, it wouldn't feel robust enough um, because I had this mindset where everything had to be 10 episodes long. And then Travis was very much along the lines of, why does it have to be 10 episodes? Can't we just make one super season that's like 14 episodes? And that's when we decided, okay, I'm going to outline a full 14 episode story. And we finally got what we have. So if, if you haven't heard it before, um, should we give a synopsis? Yeah, I, we'll get into that. I, I just wanted to add, though, it's, it's weird that we work for ourselves. We basically work for our listeners directly yes. through Patreon. They support us. So we, we're not confined to hit a specific number of episodes so long as we're releasing something fairly regularly. So our... Uh, our preconceived notions of what we thought we should do versus, oh, well, what if we just did it differently to do it differently? Because that's the way the story needs to be told. Uh, it was really helpful. And the synopsis is, uh, there's, there's two stories in one. Uh, Caitlin, you're, you want me to, okay, I guess I'll, I'll get into it. Um, there's a gentleman looking for his brother. Uh, and his, his brother, uh, Neil's got to find his brother who's, who's kind of gone missing hiking in England. Uh, somewhere near a place called Cruxmont, a really small village. And at the same time, we've got this woman named uh, Gwen Kingston, doctor. Uh, she's a doctor in, uh, help me out with this. She's it's a neurologist. He, he point, for anybody who's listening to this just on audio, he points to his head, and that kind of actually sums it up pretty well. So, <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Um, so she's a neurologist who works with patients that oftentimes have things like dementia or other um, similar symptoms and is trying to help them get better. One of these patients is a woman named Adelaide and she suddenly overnight recovers completely from not being able to talk, being almost catatonic. And whatever it was- Not catatonic, she was nonverbal. Nonverbal, nonverbal, sorry. Uh, Whatever it was, was from a small jar, which which we think might be related to Cruxmont, something that came from Cruxmont. So we're, we're on our way to an investigation, these two characters meeting, paths crossing and uh, finding out what's what's up with this sleepy little English village. Okay, this is where I try to do the dance of not spoilers to the point of the episode you've re- you've released right now. So this is where we got to try and do a little dance here. So those two stories, and I, that's, I, I picked up on that. So how do you guys balance these two stories? And, and the, as I'm listening to them, I'm like, do these necessarily need to converge into one thing other than the fact that they're both at a crux mod? So do, do you think that they necessarily need to converge and how do you balance these two things i from the writer's perspective uh absolutely believe that they need to converge for several reasons not only story-based but also um technically 
So from a technical perspective for an audio drama, if I just had one person going off and doing this, they'd have a lot of time talking to themselves, which doesn't lend to the best version of storytelling. So one of the reasons that we take two stories and have them converge in this area is so that we not only get to explore uh, different families, different dramas, different problems, different mysteries, and different, you know, no spoilers, but possibilities. Um, <laughs> We also get to have them interact. We get to have people explaining what's going on with their investigation to the other one. And that interaction allows people to further connect with the characters and allows me to not have to rely on some overly cliche tropes of people talking to themselves or taking notes all the time, which, I mean, I've used those tropes before um, for some of my other shows. Absolutely. Note taking is used plenty often in my stories. But in Don't Mind, I wanted it to be a bit more personable um, and show interactions between characters more as well. And through their interactions, through these stories converging, they help each other, they learn from each other, and eventually they make decisions together. And uh, Caitlin is the writer and creator of basically everything I make except uh, Dark Dice, where I'm just sort of a DM and an improvised thing. But uh, I'm the sound designer and editor and producer, so my, my role isn't as creative in that sense of like, here's the story, but... I'm in charge of the presentation of her ideas to make sure that they translate the way she wants them to translate. And having two characters who are constantly going kind of to the same places because they're they're there together, they're going on different, they're looking for different things, but it's a very small town, so they might as well go together. It's dangerous to go alone. It's so small, it's not even considered a town. <laughs> yes. It's and nobody seems town. to know, half the people don't even seem to know it exists, too, which I think is really fun. Yes. <laughs> so I think it, from a technical perspective, it's, it's quite delightful to have them go to some of the same places and experience things a little bit different, even, as mm -hmm. we go through. We have a... It, because whenever Travis says that he's not part of the creative team, it always feels like he's talking himself down. I just want to explain. I was just going to say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to explain how lucky we are that we get to work together because yes. if I write down the gobbledygook that is in my head on a piece of paper and try to have anybody else make sense of it, it would not come out nearly as perfect as when Travis does it. And that's because we spend a lot of time together. Obviously, we're partners, we're married, and we watch and consume all the same media. So because of that, and because of all the shared experiences we have, when I write something on paper, I'm not directly referencing like, oh, when we went to this trip and we heard this sound, but I am writing down what I think these things sound like. And he is the person who's going to hear exactly what I hear, or at least more so than anybody else. And through our combined talents, we're able to bring to life our stories and hopefully at a quality that really, really entertains and pe entertains people. I was going to say entertains and enjoys people, but that does not make sense. <laughs> it's, it's funny that you bring that up because I was actually just going to get into that because I think that there's, uh, there's effects in these episodes that really bring some of the more climactic moments to life. And at other times they really make you feel like you're kind of just there to, for lack of a better way of putting it. So Travis, how do you kind of create such realistic effects for this series, because I looked into things and I know you're no stranger to, to going someplace to get just that right sound. Absolutely. Uh, I will say uh, on this story in particular, don't mind, um, I'm co-sound designing with Dane Leonardson, uh, a friend who we've been working with for almost a year now. It's quite exciting. Uh, but I get uh, I, I directed all the actors and then kind of Dane puts this stuff together where I get the dialogue. And I've got these voices speaking, and we, a lot of them were live in a studio at the same time. We were really lucky. We had four of our actors in a studio at once. Wow. Like, I think 17, which is really cool for us. Um, so that was like two days. Uh, and then after I received that stuff, I look at the script and say, okay, well, we've got um, a pub. Now, what type of pub is this? Is this populated? Is this slightly populated? Is this really busy? So occasionally, you know, I'll check through the script. The script will give me a descriptor. I'll, uh, I'll find some stuff that I've recorded over the years because we did live in England for uh, about, I lived there for about six months. She was there for about eight or nine. Um, and we also, I'll go outside and record things because uh, a lot of Cruxmont is free of power lines. It's free of car sounds. It's free of airlines and airplanes. And we happen to live uh, in the middle of nowhere in Germany, so I can get my recording device, go outside, and then realize just how many airplanes go by. <laughs> um, but it's it's rather uh, fun to, to get all these different sounds. We actually uh, got permission to go to a mine um, kind of near where we are, and we went. We got permission to go into an old salt mine and just record the sounds of this mine for the different uh, 
underground sounds that it might have with all the water and uh, and things. Maybe not for the show. Maybe for the show. We'll find out. But we, we do go with the extra effort to make sure our, our, our episodes and our sounds uh, do sound genuine. Even the foxes you might hear um, are actually from England. <laughs> he makes it sound like we plan a lot of it, but sometimes he's a very impromptu sound recorder where he's just walking along and then we'll like open a gate or something and he'll be like oh that's a particularly squeaky gate and then he'll squeak it <laughs> that's true right? a lot of what we have the reason we have such a library internally is because I, I hear things like oh can we do that again let's go back on the elevator that's a really nice elevator <laughs> i love that i love that you're always going to have the recorder with you just like you know if you're a writer you always have like something to write down with with you so then you if you're yes. you do you're doing that you always have your recorder nearby he Absolutely. always brings it on vacation. <laughs> and it's quite heavy, too, but it's, it's worth it. Well, Caitlin, it's a vast array of possibilities. That's why. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, it's our jobs. <laughs> that's right. We're talking to Travis Van Groff and Caitlin Stats of Fool and Scholar Productions. Don't mind us, their current show, which you can hear anywhere you get your podcasts. Now, here's the deal. Going back to Crux Mind, I love how mysterious it is. Regardless of what else is going on, it seems like it's it's almost a character of in itself and it's always in the back of your mind so you guys kind of did you guys kind of treat cruxmont as a character as you were going through this process i have to say everything without spoilers so i'm trying to process I, I can, everything I no i got this you gave me an instruction, <laughs> a very specific instruction oh, okay what was that instruction i was given the instructions that in cruxmont you are not to hear electricity mm -hmm. and you're not supposed to have any sort of hums or, or like the things that we think of in everyday life, like refrigerator sounds, etc. And then whenever we flash out of Cruxmont through flashbacks or, you know, the start of the story, there's electricity. And you're always hearing electricity. And you're hearing hums. And you're hearing whirs. And you're hearing all the electronic -y stuff. And it's not like sci-fi electronics. It's the stuff that we don't even think about that's there and present all the time uh, in our day-to-day our -day lives. So from the soundscape perspective, those are my instructions, and I've kept to them very strictly. Uh, and Dane helps me uh, I guess with that that's well. Cruxmont's voice in some way. But... but uh, for you, no, I mean, as a writer. Um, <laughs> from the perspective of the story, if Cruxmont were a character, then it definitely has its own goals. It definitely has its own relationships and its own history and everything else. Um, I didn't treat it so much as a character as I treat the people who live there, the, the, the characters of Cruxmont as the characters, because they're the voice and the embodiment of what it is that this village wants. Um, yes, that is that is my answer. <laughs> we have, we've also recorded some particularly cool um, group recordings that we'll get to share later uh, as we get further into uh, yes. Cruxmont. Um, with that took a lot of effort to put together uh, and make your own fictional English village because uh, the accents in in England are very. Uh, immediately known to anyone from England and to replicate a specific region but fictionalized is, is quite an endeavor. Yep, you got to do it justice. I totally get that. Totally get it. You guys have such a wonderful cast. You were talking about that a couple minutes ago, led by Lady Agatha Danbury herself and Joa Ando, who plays Gwen. So how do you create such a wonderful chemistry between this group, especially with Anju and Daniel? Because I thought that their chemistry was particularly good so far in these early episodes. Now, Adjoa was remarkable to work with. Uh, she was fantastic. Uh, we got her in a studio and we were able to get our lead, Daniel Demarin, who's just someone we we know and have worked with. We met him at a convention in Florida many years ago and he recorded on a couple of our shows. We were working at a convention and this guy stopped by our booth and he spoke a few words. And before he was even done speaking, Travis said, have you ever considered recording your voice? <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> how we met him. And, and we've become great friends uh, over the years and we, we flew him out to London to record. He, he was like, what? Really? And he was mind blowing for him. And then we told him who his co-star was. Uh, and then we got him out there and his character is supposed to be really tired. He's just flown in from the US. It's like almost been a red eye flight. And that's exactly how Daniel got there and got straight into the studio morning of after getting off the flight. So his energy was spot on. Uh, and it, the chemistry was quite great. And then for the other characters, because it's more than just the two, we had um, David Alt, who we've worked with many years, and Erica Sanderson, uh, both of which who do voice characters on the show. Uh, and they were everyone else. Uh, so <laughs> every time you bump into anyone in Cruxmont, it was either um, David or Erica. They were the voice stand-ins <laughs> for this live recording session. Yes. And they did an amazing job. And working with Anjoa, she's such a talent that she just seemed very natural. Everything that she said was very conversationally like, yes, this is how 
everything works. She has so much experience doing like yes. BBC stuff and she's very <laughs> responsive. So if any actor gives her anything, she can, hmm, or yeah, hmm. There's lots of those that you don't think of that do happen in regular conversations. Uh, and then with the rest of the cast, it was sort of a directed session. I I was there directing the uh, the main session that we did for a couple days and directed everybody else with the memory uh, of what happened, but also our script is very descriptive on volume levels and intensity and, and emotions going on. That was It's been quite fun to blend together. So normally we work with everybody separately um, in their own corners of the world. And it was... It's our first time doing that. It was, yeah, it was a really great experience to have people together in a, uh, in a studio and have them actually have that kind of like in-person bouncing back and forth chemistry going on. Not that we haven't made great stuff in the past with people being in completely mm -hmm. different sides of the world, but it was a great opportunity. It really comes across too. I'll be honest. I I think it does in these early episodes. Anyway, I, it's it's really really apparent for me. So before I let you guys go, whether it be Don't Mind, The White Vault, or any of the other amazing shows you have, you guys have always talked about how much you appreciate your listeners. It's in every show. You offer some great Patreon perks. I love that you have the transcripts. I think that's a really cool idea. I love that you you guys do these live listen parties on Twitch. I think that's really cool. So just really quickly, how important is it for you all to have that close connection to these to these listeners? It's the most important thing. It's we we work for our listeners. Um, we don't have like a corporate overlord or <laughs> anything else pushing us to to keep creating. We work for the people who enjoy our shows and who choose to support us monetarily because I mean podcasts are free. We are creating something. I mean, we're creating something right now. It's a podcast that will go up on the internet for free that someone can listen to. Um, and a majority of our content is completely freely available. So the fact that people who are listeners who support us are deciding that what we're doing brings value and is worth something to them and that they decide to support us on Patreon is an enormous, it's a part of our life now. Um, it's the only way we're able to do what we what we do, and it's uh, it's unbelievable that it's also in, like it, its importance cannot be overstated, and it cannot be superseded by anything we do. Uh, in in my opinion, so I guess our opinion collectively. And we we really love to hang out with the people that are our fans. Like we've played Among Us with our fans. Uh, we've done the Twitch streams and the live listening parties and the Instagram meetups and everything with our fans. So that and they've like when we do a Christmas kind of fun our, our christmas uh, our christmas listening party where we just sat travis and i sat in front of our fireplace in our pajamas and we had hot cocoa and our dog was there and we told just scary like stories. told scary stories and answered <laughs> questions for hours and it's just really fun because we get to interact with people again all over the world we have listeners who are streaming in from like germany where we are or the u.s or canada or malaysia or taiwan or sweden or finland like everywhere <laughs> and it's a wonderful experience to know that we're bringing so much entertainment to people and they find that valuable and that's that's a great thing i can't explain how much uh the arts mean to me and to travis we're both very creative people we want to do things that i mean the whole reason we started podcasting is because we wanted to do something creative together yeah and for it to be what it is now is phenomenal. Very, very well said. And you guys can listen and subscribe to their. No, that was that was. So well said. I, I thought it was. I thought it was well said. I thought I thought that was beautiful. So you guys want to make sure you listen and subscribe to Don't Mind from School and Scholar Productions. You can get that wherever you get your podcasts. Also, make sure you follow the show on social media as well at Don't Mind Pod. That's where you get that, and then you can find their socials and branch out. And by the time you know it, you're going to be down the rabbit hole of all these Fool and Scholar shows all over your phones and devices. It's Travis Vengroff and Caitlin Stats. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I appreciate it. Thank you Thanks, so James. much. And you can see why they get such great support from their amazing listeners. Caitlin and Travis are just a couple of really, really great people and making high quality stuff. And I mean, you want to talk about building this from the ground up. They really, really have. And, and just the production quality on these shows and on these episodes is incredible. I love the fact that they take two weeks for each episode of Don't Mind Cruxmont. I know you're, you're waiting for the next one every time you hear the last one, but to take two weeks to make sure they get it right and get the sound and the production quality that they need, that just tells you how much they care 
about the product that they're putting out and what they're doing for you, the listener. And hopefully, just like me, you're going to go through their back catalog now because, I mean, once I started listening to Don't Mind Cruxmont, I'm like, oh, well, I need to hear what else they've got going on. So not only am I working my way through that show, I'm working my way through some of their other shows as well. So make sure you search for Fool and Scholar Productions wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to start with Don't Mind Cruxmont, I would recommend that for sure, but they've got so many other great shows as well. Once you search for them, you're going to find a treasure trove of great podcasts that I think you're really going to dig. Thanks again to Caitlin Stats and Travis Vengroff for joining me to talk about Don't Mind Cruxmont this week and Fool and Scholar Productions. Up next, oh, Obi-Wan Kenobi is finally here. We're going to talk about it full of spoilers. Be ready for that next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Vanessa Marshall, voice of Gamora on Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy and Hera on Star Wars Rebels on Disney XD. And you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. The hunt for the Jedi is on. Obi-Wan Kenobi has premiered on Disney+. Plus. The first two episodes have dropped. And quite frankly, I know it just dropped and I usually do spoiler free, but I'm too excited and jacked up to talk about this. So I'm going to have to do this with spoilers. So if you're not ready... You're going to have to fast forward a little bit because I, I cannot not talk about spoilers when I'm talking about this. So overall impressions, I got to say, I was pleasantly surprised and I was expecting to like this anyway, but I was pleasantly surprised with what I got. I was not disappointed at all. If you were, I'm sorry. I was not disappointed in the least. And one of the reasons for that, I think, was the trailers did such a great job at a, giving us what we expected and wanted from the series, but also conveniently leaving some things out. And one of the things that I will I will focus on here is that, first of all, Obi-Wan is a broken man. Like, broken down. Yes, he's in hiding. Yes, you understand. Everything he's been through, you can understand why he is where he is. But he is just, he's lost and broken. Yes, he still has a duty and a responsibility. He's watching over Luke. That's what he's supposed to be doing. But at the same time, with the Inquisitors hunting the Jedi, and he just wants to stay out of everything, and he's having nightmares, and you can just see how much the last 10 years have just worn him down. I think the comparisons to Logan that I saw before this premiered in interviews and things was very, very apt. Because that's kind of the vibe that I got from this. Again, not completely similar, but the vibe of this. That is kind of how I felt. And it was very uncomfortable to see Obi-Wan in that position. I mean, he's sitting there eating what's basically a Tatooine lean cuisine in his cave, making deals with Jawas and just trying to stay out of the way, but at the same time, still trying to watch over Luke. So when he's pulled back into everything, that is when... And he's so unsure of himself. And it gets almost frustrating at times because you're like, damn it, help, help. You've got to do something. And and that's the frustration that you feel. And you should feel that way because you know what he's capable of. And what, and what brings him back in, and this is the biggest spoiler I'm going to give you, is Leia. Leia is kidnapped. Yes, we get a, a young Leia Organa in this show. And i got to tell you, I applauded. I cheered when I saw this little girl on the screen who was full of spunk, who was so adventurous and insightful. That is the other thing. Wise beyond her years is Leia. I love this little girl. And I got to say, if you thought you loved Baby Yoda in The Mandalorian, you loved Grogu, you're going to you're gonna love a young Leia Organa, 10-year-old Leia, even more, I think, because I certainly did. I couldn't wait to just watch her get herself into trouble but then you know things get serious for her as well because she gets kidnapped they end up to, uh, on Dayu that's where Obi-Wan goes to find her and it's really Bail Organa yes Jimmy Smith's back as Bail Organa just kind of urging Obi-Wan and just pleading for him to just help out do something and then when Obi-Wan does you can tell he's still very uneasy he doesn't want to do this but one of the lines and I'm going to paraphrase this in the series when Obi-Wan's talking about his duty to Luke and I believe it's it's Bail Organa that says his sister's just as important. And I was like, damn it, yes, that's exactly right. Because you know what I didn't even consider, and shame on me for this, and shame on anyone for this, 
is that didn't even think about Leia's part of this story going into this. And and that's not okay. And I, and I fully admit that. But when I got it, I was so excited that Deborah Chow and company, uh, Deborah Chow being the director, decided to do this. Because focusing on Leia was such a smart thing to do in this situation. And it kind of brings it back full circle to A New Hope, doesn't it? Where, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. It goes all the way back to when she was 10. When she was 10. And he saves her. Well, we think he saves her. We don't really, we don't completely know that yet for sure. The ending of episode two, it ends well, okay? But at the same time, you, you don't know for sure. Obviously, she lives and all that good stuff. But we don't know how she ends up ultimately being saved. That's going to be one of the things that we're going to find out throughout the course of the series, I'm sure. It's, it looks like she's saved at the end of episode two. Let's just put it that way. But it, that, that was one of the major things that, that really excited me, at least about the early parts of this series. You know, you, you get dangled the, the shiny object in front of you, and it's like, oh, Darth Vader, oh, Luke Skywalker, young Luke Skywalker. Oh, we've got Owen Lars, who's very salty, by the way. So the Owen that you see in A New Hope, pretty much the Owen that you see in this series as well. And I'm sure we'll see more of Owen as things kind of move on because he, he wants to kind of keep Luke out of it. And, and I, I guess you can kind of understand that at a certain standpoint. The other thing that I thought was really interesting is Inquisitor Reva. And man, she's reckless, but at the same time, she is just completely 100% ambitious, full of rage, dangerous and you can understand maybe who her mentor is and why that is because she name drops Darth Vader in the second episode and you kind of see that influence on her and you get the Grand Inquisitor and again shiny object right oh here's the Grand in- Grand Inquisitor and the, you know he's the guy you're gonna have to watch out for in this series and again big spoiler fast forward if you don't want these spoilers when she kills him or at least it looks like she kills him i mean you you have to be careful here because you think somebody's dead and they might not be but when she drives that lightsaber through his gut and just kind of has that commanding takeover moment i was like whoa because there's going to be implications for that although who does she answer to darth vader who does anakin want obi-wan you can understand why she has such a drive to catch Obi-Wan it comes from the top for her clearly and we don't really get a whole lot of Darth Vader we get barely any Darth Vader in these first couple of episodes but what we do get is the threat that we didn't really know we were going to have we you, you see the Grand Inquisitor you automatically assume that because of the trailers and then Reva comes in with a ton of skill a ton of a ton of rage and a ton of ambition, and just takes over this show as the main antagonist, at least for now. We know we're going to bring Darth Vader in at some point, but at least for now, she is the main antagonist that we are focusing on. And I, I got to say, this series as a whole, I was just so excited to when, when, this, when these first two episodes were done about where the direction of this series is headed. And I think that, we're going to see Obi-Wan. We see, you know, he's rusty, obviously. So it's been 10 years since he's done anything of value, really, because he's trying to hide as well. And he basically, you know, he's like, we lost. And that and that's sticking with him. And at one point, when he, try, when he, when he qual- calls out to Qui-Gon, and there's nothing. That's the other thing. Like, did, has he lost his connection to the Force? You almost feel that way and wonder that. For, for a little bit, right? And then you see him save Leia, Spider-Man style. And that is just, it, it was just inc- an incredible moment in this episode, in, in the first couple of episodes. So Obi-Wan Kenobi, 100% did not disappoint for me. Hopefully you feel the same way. Let me know what you think. Obviously, at down and nerdy 757 on social media. Looking forward to your comments on that. I, I, I might be talking about this show a lot. We might end up doing weekly reviews of this. That's how much... I ended up loving the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, now streaming the first couple of episodes on Disney+. 
That's going to do it for my spoiler-filled review of the first two episodes of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Up next, going to head to the DC Universe and get into the multiverse with the Teen Titans Go! DC Superhero Girls Mayhem in the Multiverse. I'll review that next, again with spoilers, on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Yo, this is Greg Sipes, Teen Titans Go! You're listening to the Down and Nerdy, 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 Nerdy Podcast. Nerdy, Nerdy, Nerdy Podcast. This guy's the biggest nerd you ever met. The nerdiest of the nerds. There's more madness in the multiverse this time where we're going on the DC side. It's Teen Titans Go! and DC Superhero Girls Mayhem in the Multiverse, which is now available on Blu-ray, DVD, and of course on digital as well. And I wanted to share my my spoiler-filled review of this, but first I want to let you know that DC and Warner Brothers Home Entertainment provided me with a free copy of this Blu-ray for review, and all the and all opinions are my own. And basically what you end up having here, and again, spoilers are going to be ahead for this, but you do have a bit of a crossover, and I'll explain why I say a bit here in a second, between the Teen Titans Go! cast and the cast of the DC Superhero Girls series that really involves the Legion of Doom in, in an interesting way. Basically, Lex Luthor is harnessing this old Kryptonian power, and he's using it to send DC's biggest heroes to the Phantom Zone. Now, this is occurring in the world of DC Superhero Girls. I want to make that very, very clear, but that's the premise of this thing, and you get to see the whole, well, you know, the DC superhero girls are, are, aren't taken seriously because seriously, they're younger, and they're kind of being pushed aside, and things like that, and you're like, let, let the grown-ups handle this sort of thing, and they want, they feel like they deserve their seat at the table, especially Kara, and we get to see how that plays out throughout the course of the movie, and, and it's a very interesting kind of push and pull for Wonder Woman as well, too, because she wants to protect her friends, but at the same time, she wants to, you know, she wants to get in the fight and she wants to get things done. So it's it's interesting to see how things play out for her. And she might have one of the most more interesting arcs in this whole movie. But what we also have is a is the villain of this, which is a deep cut character. And if you're not familiar with this character, it's it's okay. Sithona is the is basically trapped in the crystal. And she's this it's this ancient Kryptonian prophecy that that she could basically that she's almost a world killer and she could just take down entire societies and entire planets at a whim and she's got a very interesting power set but I really want to go too too deep into that basically she can corrupt anybody she wants to and she ends up corrupting Lex Luthor which isn't easy to do because she wants to escape and enslave and enslave the world and she wants Basically, it's interesting because she almost want, like wants Kara to be her avatar. So it's like a, almost a Moon Knight type of situation. And we get to see that play out a little bit. But my only beef with this is the story wasn't bad. But I feel like, and it's funny because they almost mention this in the movie. Because, she says, you know, when the Teen Titans go are involved, the fourth wall is just gone. It's not even broken. It's just gone. This didn't really feel like a crossover, so I feel like the title is a bit misleading. This is a DC superhero girls movie, and maybe, and it's funny, this is almost referenced in the movie. Maybe there wasn't enough confidence to just make this a DC superhero girls movie and just let it be that. So you had to throw the Teen Titans Go name on there because you figured that I'd get more eyeballs on it, and I'm not disagreeing with that. And there's an inch, there, there is a very important moment between Zatanna and Raven that kind of sets them back on the right course. And if that, if you don't have that moment, then maybe this whole thing goes a little bit differently. So, and and there's some fun stuff between Cyborg and Bumblebee and also Robin and Wonder Woman. There's some fun stuff there as well. So when they do get together in this, in this movie, it is fun, but we only see the teen Titans go in little bits and pieces and and it's ve- it's very much you almost forget that they were there and then they kind of jump in saying the same thing like hey aren't we supposed to be in this and there's some humor in that sure but at the same time you're going okay well where's the crossover of this and it's kind of there kind of not as as far as I'm concerned so if you're going into this thinking you're going to get this big crossover it really wasn't that for me that doesn't mean it's not enjoyable Because I think DC Superhero Girls is a property that can stand on its own. But it's ironic that they're making the point in the movies saying, hey, 
we're the DC superhero girls. We're awesome. We can get the job done. You know, we don't need to be pushed aside by bigger named heroes. And then here's the movie literally kind of having to use the Teen Titans Go to attract more attention to something that people should be paying more attention to. There's just some irony there in the storytelling for me. But I, I do I really enjoy the DC superhero girls part of this story. And you get to see some great moments between Superman and Supergirl in this. And that that part of that is a credit to Nicole Sullivan, who's the voice of Supergirl, and Max Middleman, who's the voice of Superman. There's some really nice moments between the two of them. And it really props up Kara. And then you've got Tara Strong doing her thing as Batgirl and Harley Quinn. Kari Walgren is a great Zatan- Zatanna. There's a lot of great performances in this movie. But it's almost like a, you're telling me it's a crossover, so I keep expecting it to be. So I was waiting for that throughout the whole thing. I ended up enjoying the story at the end of the day. But I was almost distracted by this being billed as a crossover rather than actually either A, getting a crossover, or B, just getting a DC Superhero Girls movie. And I can understand why you would there be some hesitation to just go that route. But I think if you did that, it would almost have have been a more honest portrayal of coming into this. And I think I would have enjoyed it more without the Teen Titans Go. Even though I thought that they had they brought a lot of funny moments into this, I think that this is a DC superhero girls movie at its heart. And by the way, hey, there's nothing wrong with that because it ended up working out pretty well. That's going to do it for my spoiler filled review of the DC superhero, excuse me, Teen Titans Go. I almost made the same mistake. Teen Titans Go and DC superhero girls mayhem in the multiverse, which is now available on Blu-ray DVD and digital HD. You'll also see it on Cartoon Network here coming up and an HBO max in June. But up next, Star Wars Celebration has happened, and there was a big news dump. We'll talk about that. I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Dave Dastmalchen, creator of Count Crowley, Reluctant Midnight Monster Hunter. You are listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Turns out there's a whole lot to celebrate in Anaheim. It's time for Nerd News, and it is Star Wars Celebration Weekend. And I want to cover a lot of the news that came out on Thursday, actually. From the Star Wars Celebration, I want to go through this as quickly as I can. Some of it's just info, some of it I'll get into a little bit. But The Mandalorian, I want to start with that. Season 3 is going to be premiering in February of 2023, so we're going to have to wait a little bit longer than we normally would for The Mandalorian, but I don't hate that. I mean, get, t- take your time, do what you need to do, and we'll be waiting come Valentine's Day. I think it'll probably be around Valentine's Day, right? But apparently there was some footage shown. I wasn't there to see it. I don't want to give you somebody else's description of the footage, so I'm not going to do that. I'll just say, you know what? If you've got Grogu and Mando in their epic adventures that they're clearly going to be starting on, that's enough for me. And, you know, the single dad thing, getting back to that a little bit, I'm I'm cool with that. But how their relationship evolves from this point, I think will be interesting. And Bo-Katan going to be back as well. Katie Sackhoff shows up at Star Wars Celebration, so we'll explore... That part of things, and maybe a little bit more about the Darksaber as well. Moving on to ah- Ahsoka, we're going to see that in 2023 as well. No real new details involved there. We've also got a brand new series that's going to be coming out, Star Wars Skeleton Crew. And that is what the, is that's the project that John Watts is going to be working on. Of course, John Watts of Spider-Man fame. And of course, Chris Ford, who, did Spider- who wrote Spider-Man Homecoming, going to write this one as well. Jude Law already tapped to star in this thing. But what's interesting is the story is about a lost group of kids trying to find their way home in the Star Wars galaxy. Now, I should tell you that this takes place post-Return of the Jedi, kind of during the reconstruction period of the Republic. So Kathleen Kennedy was talking to to comicbook.com, and she said that this was inspired by Goonies. And I don't hate that at all. If you're just going to give me a show about kids that might be a little bit more geared towards a, a younger audience, but it's live action. I don't see what the, what's wrong with that. I don't think that really Star Wars has done a ton to appeal to younger audiences and more younger audiences in a live action capacity at this point. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just because it's for younger audiences doesn't mean it needs to be animated. Can we get that out of our heads? And the flip side goes as well. Just because it's animated doesn't mean it can't be for older audiences 
and, and adults as well. So we really need to get that stigma out of our heads at this point. But, you know, it's funny because I think it was John Watts that said in an interview that I saw somewhere that, you know, they cut people's heads off in Clone Wars. So, you know, where's the line? And <laughs> he's got a good point there. So you got to think about it this way. Just because it's about kids, it might be a little bit for kids, doesn't mean you can't enjoy it either. And I enjoy Goonies just as much as, as an adult as I did when I was a kid. So I, I think that if that's the benchmark, don't get anything in your head just yet. And then you've got Jude Law starring in this as well. And he brings a little bit of legitimacy to this. So I think that this is something that could be an untapped audience in Star Wars so far in a new series that I think could really, really be interesting. And again, you never really know until things start to get moving. But I like that they're thinking of different things and exploring different parts of the galaxy as well. We got a trailer for Andor, which is the new series about Cassie and Andor, of course. And uh, well, there's more to it than that. But it's going to be coming out in August 31st of 2022 on Disney+. Plus. We know that now as well. And Andor, we don't really get a ton from this trailer other than... It's really at the height of the um, at the empire when when things are really starting, and you know people are scared because of 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 what's going on, and basically this is the very very start of the rebellion against the am- empire, where people get involved, how they start to get involved, how they start to rise up, and why, because you see that if there's a couple things you see in this trailer. First of all, you see the fear. Second of all, you see the deception and the shadiness that's kind of going throughout the galaxy at this point. But then you also start to see people start to get involved a little bit. And then you start to see the action ramp up a little bit, too. And then you see Cassian here and there. We don't really see a ton of him in this trailer. But ultimately, what this is going to end up being is his path to becoming a hero for the Rebels. And, you know, later on down the line, which, of course, we know from from Rogue One. So uh, this, uh, again, getting deeper into the how, what's been going, what we know about the big moments in Star Wars fandom and in the story, how do they affect ground level people? Because the movies never really focused on that. So if this series is going to get into that, like I think it's going to, then that's something that I'm really, really interested in. And then you've also got the story of Cassian Andor and how he becomes the hero he ultimately becomes. And remember, he wasn't always a great dude. So we find out how maybe that turn happens for him as well. And yeah, this this is one that I've, I've really been wanting to see for a while. I'm glad we're finally going to be getting it a little bit later on this year. And don't forget Tony Gilroy, the showrunner and creator of this series too. So I'm glad we got a little bit of a peek behind the curtain there of Andor and things seem to be moving forward. Now we move kind of away from Star Wars and we go more towards some of the other Lucasfilm stuff. We get a trailer for Willow as well, the Willow series. You might have forgotten all about that. That's going to be happening on November the 30th of 2022. Warwick Davis is back as Willow. If you remember the movie, I think it came out in 1988, if I'm remembering correctly. And this is one that... I've really, really been excited for it. it. Willow was one of those movies that always was in the back of my mind when I was younger. It was never like my favorite movie. It was never like my go-to, but I would watch it not nearly as much as like Star Wars and things like that. But it's one of those movies that I would I would always find myself watching every now and then. And every time I did, I loved it. Basically, you've got this unlikely hero in Willow. And you saw he was an aspiring magician, now very much a magician. He was supposed to protect the girl who, you know, was supposed to unite the realms. And, you know, they destroy the evil queen. They banish forces of darkness and things like that. Now it seems like they kind of got to do that again. And this time they're, they're creating another team to do that as well. And this is where the adventure kind of continues. And you see in the trailer, they find Willow and say like, hey, we need you again. We need your magic. And... This, it's described as an unlikely group of heroes. So this, the pairings will be, will be very intriguing once we get them. We, we get to see a little bit of what that's going to be in the trailer. We get to see a lot of action in this trailer. So just be prepared 
for that as well. But when you call something a dangerous quest to places far beyond their home, I in the description, I guess that kind of, you know, makes sense. And there's going to be not just stuff that they have to face outwardly, but apparently they're going to be facing your inner demons as well. And when you've got an unlikely group, there's obviously going to be, I'm sure, some friction there, some disagreement as well. So how this group's actually going to get along, I think will go a long way to find out how this series is going to go and, and what the story, how the story is going to be. And I think that it's just, it's, Willow seems like one of those characters that can bring everybody together. Not just an unlikely hero, but a leader as well that you don't necessarily expect. But I can see him in moments kind of rallying the troops a little bit, right? Bringing everybody back together. And almost he can almost play the card of, you know, hey, I've been here. I've done this already. So we need to get it together. We also have Joanne Whaley, who's going to be coming back as Sorsha, if you're a fan of the original movie as well. But there's, you know, there's plenty of other cast members that are going to be a part of this thing as well. You've got Ellie, ba- Ellie Bamber, who's going to be a part of this, Ruby Cruz, Aaron Kellyman, and the, maybe not household names that you know, but this is one of those kind of shows that can make you a household name, especially if you can capture the magic of the original, literally and figuratively. So again, this is one of those franchises that I kind of got lost in the shuffle. And it's easy to do that when you've got Star Wars and Indiana Jones that are being made from somewhere. And then, of course, you've had some other things in the mix as well from Lucasfilm. So I'm glad to see Willow getting the spotlight back again. And could this be you know, the final continuation of the story. I guess we'll have to wait and see how this series goes first to to find out the answer to that. Really quickly, we did get a first look image at the new Indiana Jones movie that's going to be coming out on June 30th of 2023. That release date still holds true. I'll talk about the image in a second, but Harrison Ford actually made a surprise appearance. Him being at Star Wars Celebration should never be a surprise. It should just be like something that's known not that he would go to every one per se but as indiana jones and han solo the dude can show up whenever he wants but one of the things he said when he was on stage was he was talking about how much he enjoyed working with director james mangold who remember did logan so i don't know that we're gonna get a as intensive a movie in indiana jones 5 as we got with logan but clearly james mangold has experience dealing with heroes who are definitely in the twilight ages of their careers. And that's very much true for Harrison Ford's Dr. Jones. I am, I have every confidence that James Mangold can handle this, even though I'm very, very nervous about another Indiana Jones movie. And I think rightfully so, based on what we've gotten recently, I mean, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull maybe is an outlier and maybe that we, we need to kind of let that go now. And that's not one of those movies that I think we're going to look back on fondly. You know, like people are looking at the prequels for Star Wars with different eyes now. I don't think that's going to happen here with, uh, with Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Sorry, but I, maybe it's time to not really focus on that and focus on the fact that we're getting an amazing cast for this too, like Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Mads Mikkelsen, Antonio Banderas, and plenty more going to be a part of this thing. There's there's a lot of reasons to be excited about another Indiana Jones movie. Plus, you get John Williams coming back to score the thing. You get Give me the music of John Williams too. Yeah, this is something that I think that we're too hesitant about this. We may, maybe need to be a little bit more excited then we are hesitant about another Indiana Jones movie. So I, I think that this, you know, we although we didn't get much in this new image, which is kind of a darkened image of, of Indy kind of going through the, the motions of another exploration, it, for a lack of a better way of putting it. I know that's vague, but you've seen the picture. You tell me what's going on in there. So I, I think that until we know more, it's hard to judge, but I think that it's constantly being on edge about what this is going to be about and and being nervous that it's going to suck is not a great way to go. So let's shift things at least a little bit more to the middle until we get more information. 
couple more trailers I want to talk about before we wrap this up. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning had to release their trailer for part one because it leaked anyway. So they decided to, to release it. And that, of course, is going to be coming in the summer of 2023. And if there was a role that Tom Cruise was born to play, isn't it Ethan Hunt? It really, really is, isn't it? It just seems to sort of encapsulate his entire career. And he's played the character for so long. And I'm not sure anybody else could have done it as well as he has up to this point. Say what you want about Tom Cruise, but him as Ethan Hunt is money every freaking time. And you get to see Ethan kind of at a crossroads right now where you where you see in the trailer, they say, you know, you need to pick a side because the side of good was never, basically never even existed because you think what you what you thought existed was an anomaly sort of thing. And then you just see the nonstop freaking thrill ride of action. And I know that these are like buzzwords and all these things that, you know, and you hear them all the time, but it doesn't really ring more true than it does for a Mission Impossible movie. If you want to just have a, a nice thrill ride, get some great action and maybe some twists along the way, that's Mission Impossible. Don't overthink it. OK, this is one of those movies you don't want to overthink. You want to just enjoy the ride because that's exactly what you're going to get. And then you get some maybe interesting character moments as well, not just characters from the movies that we've known from over the years, like Simon Pe- Pegg and Ving Rains and things like that. But also, you've got Haley Atwell joining things. It looks like she's going to be spending a lot of time with with Tom Cruise's character, Ethan Hunt. So I think that she's going to fit in really, really well with this group and, you know, the threats that they're facing. And they're going to go big on this one, especially if they've broken it into two parts. They are really really going to go big for Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. So remember, part one going to be coming out summer of next year. Summer of this year, we're going to be getting a new movie from the Russo Brothers on Netflix, and that is The Gray Man, which is the spy thriller, which is going to hit Netflix on July the 22nd. We got the new trailer for that, and we get basically spy versus spy Ryan Gosling versus Chris Evans, and Chris Evans is the bad guy, with the with the douchebag mustache, I think is really, really fun. So you set a fun tone there. But also, there's some serious stuff going on there. Watching these two guys basically try to kill each other. And Ryan Gosling's character just trying to survive as a, as a CIA operative. Court Gentry, that's the name of his character. Sierra Six is his code name. So you see that he's plucked from a federal penitentiary. I'm going to kind of paraphrase the synopsis here. And he's recruited by Billy Bob Thornton's character, who's Donald Fitzroy. That's his handler. And he is one of the gray men. Basically, the guys that the CIA sends in when they can't officially send someone in sort of thing. You know, the merchant of death is how they call it. But now, you know, things have kind of flipped. And now Sierra Six is the target. And Lloyd Hansen, who's Chris Evans' character, is the former CIA member who's now going to try and take him out. You've also got Anna DeArmas who is a part of this as well as Agent Danny Miranda. And you've got, again, this is another star-studded cast. And I just think that this is just going to be not just a fun spy thriller, but a fun cat-and-mouse game between these two characters as well. It looks fun. It looks like there's a ton of action. You've got certainly a lot of star power behind this, not just in front of the camera, but behind it too. So I don't know what there isn't to look forward to with the gray man. And this is one that I am going to hold to a little bit of higher standard though. Well, I'm looking for a little bit more from the gray man and hopefully it's going to deliver. I don't think it's going to disappoint. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the down and nerdy podcast. Again, thanks to my wonderful guest K a stats and Travis Vengroff from fool and scholar productions. Don't forget to stream a new episode of don't mind Cruxmont wherever you get your podcasts this coming Tuesday and every couple of Tuesdays until the end of the season. Also, make sure you subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcast, whether it be Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Please, please, please subscribe to the show. The show doesn't happen without your support. And bigger things can happen. The more you support the show, the bigger the show can get over the years, and I really appreciate your support there. Also, follow along on social media, at Down and Nerdy 757 on Twitter and Instagram, and at Down and Nerdy on Facebook. And always online at downandnerdypodcast.com. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds.